Hello, and welcome back to Anime Archaeology. And today I want to talk about Otakon 2022. Now, I already did a video on what went well for me at the convention. This video is going to be about what went poorly. And I'm going to separate this out into two pieces. I'll talk about what went poorly for me as an individual con goer, and then some of the struggles I had as a panelist behind the scenes. Now, this is not intended to make anyone feel bad, particularly staffers at Otakon. I want to be honest about my experiences. I want to let folks know what actually happened, at least to me. But I'm not going to single out any individual con staff. I don't think anyone was actively trying to make this year particularly difficult or whatever. But I will spend some time at the end of the video talking about what seemed to be happening to me. First off, it was unfortunate that the vaccine policy wasn't announced until that was a bit of an unfortunate misstep. <clears throat> a somewhat less understandable misstep was the fact that the schedule wasn't posted to the guidebook mobile app until about two days before the convention started. Oticon 2022 went live in guidebook maybe like a week only before the con, maybe a week and a half, a couple weeks, but it didn't have a schedule in it at all. You could get to the schedule on the website, but you couldn't actually get it to it on the mobile site, on the mobile app, you know, guidebook. And the problem there is that, you know, okay, you could look and see what was on the schedule, but when you were at the con, you wanted to have everything, you know, set up in guidebook and all of your the things you wanted to do listed in there on the My Schedule side, and you couldn't do that until literally like a couple of days before the con. That was really frustrating because you couldn't really plan and set up at a reasonable kind of time that way. Then when you actually got to the convention, I was surprised to discover that bag check was completely inconsistent. I came with a bag two days out of the then only four that I was there, that's a whole other story. And sometimes my bag was checked and sometimes it wasn't. I guess they were just spot checking bags, but it seems to me bad things could have happened if they didn't check those bags consistently every time. I don't know if that was a security policy thing or a, an Otakon policy thing, but that made me uncomfortable. It was also frustrating when I tried to attend the Toonami panel and retrospective with C. Bloom and Bo Billingsley because we showed up, I don't know, maybe half an hour before the panel began. Our line was already forming. Staff didn't organize the line at all until the staff started to actually block the hallways and then they started to really push the line to various places. And staff were, let's just say, frazzled. Then after sitting in line for maybe five, ten minutes, we noticed that the previous room, I think it was been about 15 minutes because the previous room finished out. They let a few people into the room and then let us all know that the room was full. Meaning they didn't clear the room. Folks just camped out in that panel room between the first and the, the second panel, which meant that the folks who were actually lining up for the panel didn't get a chance to go in. That felt unfair. Again, given the fact that there's plenty of room clears for other panels, for, especially for a very big panel like that, it felt arbitrary. Right? It felt like there were different policies at different times that just didn't, didn't make sense to me. And it was frustrating to, again, sit there in line and then be told, well, that was worthless. And again, it would be fine if I showed up, the line was hugely long, and then I sat in line, and it turned out it was 1,000th in line. It's that we were like 50th in line, and we couldn't get in. So that was unfortunate. I was also surprised by how the art auction was handled this year. I know a lot of folks don't do the art auction, but typically you write down your bids on a piece of paper next to the art you want to bid on, and then if it gets enough bids, it goes to an actual um, live auction at the end of the con. Well, this year they decided to go digital. Uh, you had to actually go to a website to bid on the art auction. The problem is... The convention center doesn't have free Wi-Fi. It's on their cell phone, and the cell phone signals were pretty maxed out. I couldn't hit a lot of internet services. I couldn't, you know, get a lot of the things that I normally do internet-wise on my phone. We'll get to more of that later. So I tried to get to some of these auction services, and I couldn't. Like, I could not load the website for the art auction. And this happens every year. Like, internet is always hard to get to at Otakon. 
So it was unfortunate that I was like, there's something I, I wanted to bid on and I literally physically couldn't. But a friend of mine tried to bid and could actually get internet on his phone once he found a little spot where he could get internet and discovered that there was no information in either guidebook or the art auction website on how to collect your art or where to collect your art or what live auction was. It, you, you were just told it will go to live auction. That's a pretty big miss to not say, hey, go here to get the art that you are spending money on. Again, it's a little thing, but it seems like the art auction is not new. They've been doing the art auction for a very long time. And so to miss that just was frustrating. He actually didn't bid very high on the art he was going for because of that. He was like, I'm not comfortable with this because I'm just not clear what the process is. I also have to call out that I personally had a negative interaction with the staffer. We were in dealer's room when it was closing at 6 p.m., which was a surprise to a lot of people. And me and some friends were sitting at a table just grabbing food. And as it was, as it was closing, like at six o'clock, we were you know, eating our meal. A staffer came through with a bullhorn saying something, but the acoustics in there, the echoing was so bad, I couldn't tell what the person said. And I turned around to other people and, and they were saying to each other, what, what is that person? We can't, we can't tell what they're saying. So I leaned over as the person was going by and said, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Could you please repeat that? And this person looked me dead in the eye and said, and I quote, halls closed, get out now. My goodness. The person then went on to say, if you don't get out now, you will be escorted out. Not exactly a welcoming message from Otakon staffers. Speaking of the dealer's room closing at 6 p.m. on Saturday, again, this came as a surprise to a lot of people. I actually overheard a dealer saying, why are we closing at 6? And fortunately, they, uh, or Otakon staff, pushed an update to the, uh, the hours. We'll get to that in a minute. Pushing updates, that is. And the message was, well, let me read it. 10 a.m. to italicize 6 p.m. And in bold, 6 o'clock p.m. on Saturday. The dealer's room closes earlier on Saturday because it opens earlier on Saturday. The dealer's room has, bold, closed at 6 p.m. on Saturday, unbold, for over 20 years, parentheses. Yes, really, we checked the archives, unparentheses. We didn't change the Saturday hours this year. We didn't change the Saturday hours last time either. The dealer's room has, bold, closed at 6 p.m. on Saturday, unbold, since Bill Clinton was president, shot before dinner. This is what I call being passive aggressive with your attendees. Not a great look. And speaking of guidebook updates, they pushed updates to the guidebook quite frequently throughout the con. Now, I can understand why they might want to do that, but unfortunately, because, again, cell signal was kind of saturated, there were times when I couldn't access the guidebook for 10 to 20 minutes at a time because an update had been pushed, and I, literally, it, I couldn't pull it down. And guidebook won't show you anything in the guidebook until it's updated. So I was like locked out of the guidebook for quite a while. And so this is the primary way Otakon wants you to interact with their, you know, their schedule and such. I couldn't do that for significant amounts of time at the con. They were doing that, you know, over and over every day. So there were a lot of times when I didn't know what to do, where to go, because they'd push another update and I just didn't know it was available, I was kind of SOL. And the final problem was something that I didn't personally experience, but I saw a lot of online. And I, I did see this. Lines were very, very, very long to get in. According to posts on Reddit and such, lines were multiple hours long, and staff gave conflicting information on where to go and, and where, where to check in. I actually had a bit of this myself, but for, you know, most of the time, I was able to get in fine, but that was partly because I was getting in there early and leaving late every day. So if you weren't doing that, apparently the experience was really bad. And with the temperatures, what they were in D.C. on that concrete, it, a lot of people felt that it was unsafe, and I can understand why. So those are all the problems that might affect your average attendee of Otakon. But I was a panelist this year, and unfortunately... 
I have a whole other set of things that went wrong for me as a panelist. First off, and I appear to be the only one among people I know who are panelists, I never received any notification that any of my panels were accepted. Nothing. I've checked my email, I've checked my spam, nothing. I didn't find out my panels were accepted until my friends said, hey, the schedule is online, which was two weeks before the convention. So I didn't even know if my panels were accepted until two weeks before the convention started. Again, not a great feeling as a panelist to suddenly realize, oh, I'm actually doing these panels. And then I looked at my panels and saw, so I went there with a group of panelists. So we were doing some group panels and I also had some panels of my own, two of them. Of the two panels that I did, one was called A Parent's Guide to Anime. And you can imagine it's a guide to anime for parents who maybe don't know anime very well, want some idea of what's going on, etc. Want to know what's kind of good for their kid. And uh, that panel got scheduled for 10 p.m. on Saturday. You know what parents are doing at 10 p.m. on Saturdays? They're getting some sleep, especially after escorting their kid around a convention for the entire day. They're not attending panels. My Parents Guide the Anime panel had a total of 12 attendees, of which two were personal friends who were hanging out at the convention with me. And then my group's panels were scheduled for basically the beginning of the day and not the end of the day, but very late in the evening, like late at night, every day so we had like 8 45 a.m friday morning then like 10 30 friday night like 10 a.m saturday morning 10 p.m and and back for one person it's like 11 p.m saturday night and then 10 a.m sunday morning so if we wanted to support our panels we had to arrive early and stay late and that felt again like we just weren't being attended to, like we were just shoved onto the ends of the schedule with no regard to what might work for us. And I know scheduling conventions is difficult, but they couldn't even say, hey, this is how this worked out, apologies. No, just you're stuck. Oh, and by the way, also, one of my panels and one of my group's panels were double booked. They were scheduled for the same time. But then there was getting to the convention, and that's a whole other story. So all the panelists got an email saying, hey, if you're doing a panel early Friday morning, you're strongly encouraged to get there Thursday evening to get your badge registered, get your vaccine wristband, and to get your panelist ribbon. And every panelist gets a little ribbon they stick on their badge to show that they're a presenter. We were also told in that email that we would not be allowed on stage unless we had a presenter ribbon. But don't worry. When we showed up on Thursday, there would be line skip. If we went to the line, told them we were panelists, we would be kind of let in, given a you know, priority pass in to you know, take care of everything and be taken to programming ops. We got this early in the week before Oticon, just a few days before Oticon, so I decided, okay, I will do the right thing because one of our group's panels was at 8.45 a.m. Friday morning. So I was like, all right. So I sacrificed my Thursday evening, took a lift into D.C., went there, went to the, to the line, told them I was a panelist, and they said, no, panelists can't line skip. I said, I was, I was told, and they, they said, no. You know, I just checked, and they told me panelists have to go to the back of the line. Went to the line, got in, got my badge verified, got my vaccine wristband, found the person to take me to programming ops, was led up to programming ops, told them I was a panelist, whereupon they said, oh yeah, unfortunately we don't have any panelist ribbons. And we won't have them until 9 a.m. the following morning. Whereupon I told them, well, that doesn't help me because my panel begins at 8.45 tomorrow morning, one of my group's panels. So they said, oh, well, just, just show up and we'll figure out something. So I went home, got some sleep, got up early, because who knew if I could actually get in early? And it turns out I couldn't, again, even as a panelist, nope. So I, I was at the Marriott, and at 8 a.m., they still didn't have the metal detector set up, so they literally started late Friday morning getting people in. Good sign. And so managed to get in, managed to get up to programming ops 
and said, hey, I'm here, filled out the paperwork, which of course I couldn't do the day before, filled all that out, had some questions answered, and the person running programming ops was basically dealing with other people and wasn't dealing with the panelists, finally got their attention to help me, and here's what they came up with. They took a piece of paper, scribbled this down on it, and then put a couple of little, like, animal stamps on it, and this was my panelist pass. This is what I was supposed to show to people at our, our panel to prove to them that we were panelists. But we went to our panel, the paper worked, we were allowed to do our panel, and we were allowed to do all the rest of our panels. Fortunately, at the end of our panel, a staffer came up and literally threw ribbons at us and then left. And so we were able to put those on our badges and leave. So that's good, I guess. But uh, now, obviously, none of these are massively huge problems. I wasn't, you know, spit on or anything, right? There, there's nothing here that is, is overwhelmingly terrible. But it's death by a thousand cuts. There are so many little problems that it just kind of erodes my enjoyment of the con. I didn't have a good time at Oticon this year, I gotta admit, because of all these little problems. There's just a lot of little frustrations that added up to a, a negative experience for me personally. I know lots of other people who went and had a great time, but for me, I really did not enjoy this year at Oticon. Now I do wanna address something that folks have brought up online the large attendance this year and saying that staff were completely overworked. I'm not convinced of that because the complaints I saw and the problems I had were not that staff were not there. Staff was there. Staff, there, was, there was plenty of staff that I saw to handle what was going on. There were people around directing folks. There were people to talk to. There were plenty of staffers going around with little info you know, flags. It wasn't that there wasn't enough staff, it was that staff gave either conflicting information or didn't have information and couldn't tell people what they needed to know. That seemed to be the problem, that staff were underprepared. And again, not underprepared for the volume of people, but they just weren't told enough about things or just didn't sink in, I don't know. But there was just a lot of confusion. In fact, one thing I didn't mention back then is that panelists didn't have to have masks on when they were presenting. This is a standard COVID thing. You're a good distance from everyone else, so you could have your masks off. None of the panelists were told that. So half the panels I went to, the panelists still kept their masks on, which made it a lot harder to understand them. <clears throat> a lot of little things like that where just stuff wasn't told. And that, to me, was the problem, is it was like an under-training of the staff, not that there weren't enough staff for the volume. Fundamentally, two things on that. One is that a line of 500 people and a line of 600 people are managed the same way. Yes, they take up more space, but fundamentally, you don't need more people to handle a somewhat longer line. It's still managed the same. So... That doesn't seem to hold. Also, as far as I know, everyone who showed up got a badge, which means Oticon had enough badges for the number of people who got in, which meant that somebody knew or thought that there might be 40,000 plus people at this Oticon. They had enough capacity to get everyone in. They had enough badges to get everyone in. So at least whoever was ordering the badges thought there might be this many people. So I don't think that, that this number of people was insanely, incomprehensibly unmanageable by this number of staff. There seemed to be enough staff from what I could see. They just did not effectively handle what they were given. They weren't told how to handle these things. And they definitely didn't have a lot of great training in interpersonal skills. I'll just say this. Nothing terrible that I know of, but just a lot of very harassed and annoyed staff. Even on like Thursday evening, I saw frustration from the staff. That makes an unpleasant experience for everybody. And I'm sure there are reasons for that. In fact, I know there are reasons for that because some of the things I overheard con staff say. But it just makes for an unpleasant experience. So again, 
I am not saying that anyone on the staff wanted Otakon to go poorly. I'm not saying this was a conspiracy. I'm not saying that this was somebody just, you know, throwing up their hands and, and not caring. But my first Otakon was 2001, over 20 years ago. And at this point, I don't want to go back next year. <laughs>